All right. Uh, my name is Dennis, um, and uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, zero downtime migrations and how we can get there with Pulp 3. I'm going to start sharing my screen. Um, if I get it working. I have to do everything twice for some reason, but all right, it says that I'm sharing, I think. Can you see my screen? Yes. Awesome. I'm going to make it a little bigger. Yeah. All right. So we've uh, discussed uh, zero downtime migrations at open floor before, <clears throat> but I will go over some of the motivations uh, here today. Uh, for most people, uh, downtime is not desirable. Uh, operators of pulp don't want to take pulp down in order to do upgrades because they have um, services, uh, clients all over the world, different time zones that rely on those services. And so it's hard to pick downtimes that will work for everyone. Um, Clustered installations uh, make the uh, uh, downtime even more complicated because you have to take all pieces of your uh, cluster down, perform upgrades on all of them, and then bring them up. And uh, this requires pretty much coordination by a human uh, doing this. It's really complicated to add support for that in our installer. Um, and as we uh, work towards uh, deploying pulp on Kubernetes and have those deployments managed by the pulp operator, this uh, pretty much becomes a requirement because in those environments, uh, there is uh, pretty much uh, and the implied uh, guarantee that the services remain running because whenever you take a container down, it's supposed to respawn. And so there's a uh, need to be able to run two versions of a container, the latest one and the previous uh, version of it also. And so right now uh, that's uh, not possible with the way migrations work in pulp. The migration, the upgrade process right now uh, requires that users stop all the services, upgrade the code by either upgrading from PyPI or if they're using their RPMs, they upgrade the RPMs, then run the migrations and start all the services. And when you're doing this all on one box, uh, you can do this fairly simply. Even uh, using our installer, you can do this. Um, when it comes to multiple boxes, it gets more complicated. So are there any questions about the motivation and just yeah, the problems that we have with our upgrade process right now? Yeah, so I, I thought that the installer doesn't stop the services. It just upgrades code, runs migration, and restarts services. Or it upgrades okay. codes, restarts services, runs migrations. And, and, and that may be what it does. But the issue, I think, is that if that is what it does, then the problem is right. <laughs> yeah. well, the issue is that um, when migrations apply SQL uh, schema alter statements, then the application code that is still con connected to that database will begin to error. Yeah. Well, it, was my, it was my question that I think Django admin doesn't allow you if there are any connections to the database to run migrations. I think it does. I think it doesn't, and, I, and I'm not sure. We need to check. But I, th I experienced this error a lot in my dev environment, but I think it's because I'm running pclean. And yeah, it doesn't let you drop the database. It doesn't let you drop the database. Aha. Uh -huh. Maybe it's also my experience. <laughs> yeah. And uh, you might be right, uh, Tanya, but uh, from 
what I've read, I think people are doing this. Uh, well, I mean, it's an important application specifically. Yeah, it's an important part because there should be some migrations at some point being run, right? And with the zero downtime. Okay. I, and I want to add to what Brian said. Um, you said application code might start to error, and I think that's the good case. <laughs> it might be run without errors, but doing the wrong thing. Yeah. Right. <laughs> that is a very good point, Matthias. And so. Uh, um, I want to call out uh, an important difference between Pulp 2 and Pulp 3 that is a motivator, a big motivator for this kind of work. In Pulp 2, because all of the uh, binary file serving happened via files that were on a file system, what people would do during their upgrades for Pulp 2 is they would stop their workers and their resource manager and in Postgres the and the REST API, thank you. But they would leave their Apache system serving their content. And so if we look at the impact for what an upgrade experience was like in Pulp 2, the massive number of clients that were fetching data during the upgrade while it was occurring could still fetch data. And this is a very desirable property. And now, because Pulp 3 no longer uses that file system layout, you can't do that anymore, which means that unlike our previous major version software, you cannot have your clients, your clients will experience an outage in a way that they did not with Pulp 2 because of the architectural change, because our binary data is now served in a way that involves the database, in a way that involves uh, the um, Gunicorn pulp core content app. Yep. And this is an important change that motivates this need for, in pulp three in a way that we actually didn't have the same motivations in pulp two. Right. I'm wondering if like any sort of caching solution users may have would be able to, or, or if there's an exporter, if that would, you know, if that would yep. solve it, address the needs of large scale sites. Yes, that, uh, that's a way. Yeah, yeah, and I believe we discussed something earlier in the week about providing exporters that provide behavior that is similar to Pulp 2 symlinks. Um, but I believe there's still motivation to uh, make upgrades easier for the most common use case where you're using the pulp core content app with the database to serve your content. Agreed. One of the things that we established. Oh, if I, I'm only adding, I don't think, yeah, yeah. If you go back to the top of the page, you'll see that the, you state that it's complicated for the, uh, to stop all parts of the cluster before any before any of them is upgraded. I don't think that's going to be too hard for us to support. I think that would be feasible. It would be not too hard. Yeah, I, I agree. I, the crux of the issue isn't that it's, I agree with you, Mike. It's not that it's complicated. It's that it creates an outage. Right, exactly. Cool. Um, we can update that language. Uh, I would like to go down to what does the zero downtime upgrade process look like? <clears throat> um, we've already established that in order to support zero downtime upgrades, it, we would require users to go from one Y release to another. Um, in order to get to allow plugin writers and pulp core to have migrations that uh, when run in a specific order can be relied on to not be uh, disruptive to the system and so all of this discussion is based on the assumption that the upgrade is happening from either for a bug stream 
uh, a patch release, so a Z stream, or to the next Y release. And in those instances, um, users should be able to upgrade the code of the application, run the migrations while the application is still running, and then uh, restart services uh, as needed um, on uh, different parts of their cluster, which means that they can upgrade the code at uh, different times on the different parts of the class cluster. Thank you for updating uh, the language there on bullet three. Uh, does everybody uh, agree that this is what a zero downtime upgrade process is? I would maybe add that there can be some rollback if something goes wrong. That's and that's really hard. Um, and I'm not. <laughs> I know. But that is one of the things. Whether we plan for the first instantiation of this or not, I guarantee you, users of Pulp who are managing large installations are going to want to are going to ask the question: you know, What if I've decided that it was a terrible idea and I need to back off? And I don't know that I have an answer for that, but I know it's going to be a requirement. So. Note that we have many products that do not have an answer to that. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. So Django, I mean, Django, in theory, uh, provides mechanisms for us to write migrations that uh, both support upgrades and downgrades, mm -hmm. which means that a migration re provides SQL or you know Django operations that will uh, remove whatever was done in the upgrade. However, there are still instances where it's just not possible. Yeah, yep. yeah. Um, the if, if that, that is if that is a requirement, I think backups and restores are the way. Um, I just wanted to say, in the old way, it's easy. You stop all the service, you make a backup, you upgrade the stuff, and then you can roll back at any later time. I think in the new way, it's the same. You make a backup. It, it's everything you just said. Same, okay, same, same. But that involves the downtime. No, it doesn't. You can no. do more backups in Postgres. Okay. Yeah, you can, you can configure more backups. Yeah, I mean, you would configure. Um, there's there's some really excellent um, snapshotting workflows with the write ahead log in Postgres. And sometimes people like to coordinate the that moment in time snapshot um, with the with a um, a file system snapshot, and that's part of the, the trick with Pulp is that you have to do both the DB and the file system at the same moment, and so you end up relying on um, a uh, I'm forgetting the file system technology here, but uh, it's it's the it's... journaling. Are you thinking about a journaling file system, Brian, or are you thinking of something else? No, I'm thinking about ex. I'm thinking about um, LVM an LVM snapshot, for example. Right. Uh, right, right. A lot of people do backups with LVM snapshots, right. and that that allows you to take a right at that moment, so that way you don't have to like walk the file system over time. Yep. Um, and what you do is you coordinate with the LVM snapshot with your Postgres write ahead log snapshot. And oh look, if we keep the write ahead log on the LVM system, it's actually one moment in time. Yep. And so, and the thing is, you know, with all of this that we're talking about. Pulp is absolutely not inventing this process. There's been a ton of research. So Postgres has support, and the file system has support, and clusters have the support. Um, so we're, go we're going to be riding on the shoulders of people that have done a lot of hard work, um, which doesn't mean there aren't going to be holes, and it isn't difficult. And sometimes you're looking at it going, I, I don't know how we're going to do that with this particular migration. Um, but we're not inventing this out of whole cloth, which makes me feel a little better. Matthias, I agree with your point. Um, my calling out of like uh, all these things is basically just I, I agree with it, and I think yeah. there are ways. There's answers. It's a, I mean, it's a really good. It's a real exactly. It's a really good observation. I, there's uh, there are just answers to a lot of these questions. We just have to make sure that we ask the question and have it written down in our how-to doc. 
to take advantage of the, the stuff that's out there as well. And I think here it means our migrations must not be rollbackable. Yes, I, I don't think that we want to start. I don't think we want to make that a requirement One for two reasons. Yeah. One, it's really hard. And two, there are situations where it cannot be done. For example, situations where data has been combined in a way that you could not uncombine them later because you've lost the original records. Exactly right. Exactly yeah. right. Well, those situations cannot appear because you cannot combine them until you have the old parts of the program not running on the database anymore. Cool. Let's uh, discuss that uh, in one minute. Yeah. <laughs> um, yes. uh, so today, I want us to try to put some thoughts together on how we can get there. Um, and there are basically two things that we need for us to be able to move forward with this goal. We need to uh, come up with documentation that outlines the requirements for plugin writers um, that outline what, how they can introduce changes and, uh, and what kind of changes are appropriate when uh, so that the incremental change allows this kind of upgrade. And then after we tell uh, plugin writers what they can do, we need to also provide them with a CI. Uh, the plugin template needs to have checks in it that will guarantee that will check the migrations that come with code to make sure that they are compatible in, with the policy that we outlined in the documentation. And um we um so this is what i want us to discuss um and this is kind of what matthias was going into uh a second ago uh what what does it mean what are the requirements for migrations and one of the things i believe uh, we discussed before is that um destructive changes uh, need to come a release after the additive changes or I don't even know what the best way to put can, this is. Can I describe this? Yes, please. Um, so my understanding of the of the approach here is that anytime um, if you're making additive changes, then but that's not a problem. You can put those migrations in. They don't. They they don't. Um, uh, running old application code with a database that has ha had additive changes will not cause a problem. Um, they will not be used until the application code restarts. But there will be no errors. The issue comes in when, say, you do like a uh, a rename of a of a attribute name uh, in which in the database will cause you to have to run a schema alter statement, and this would be a destructive change because your old application codes using the old name, you apply the migration, your database has renamed the table, actually it's schema layout, and now you have a problem. So the trick is to split your destructive changes into two parts. Um, and a rename is a good example, and all the different destructive changes can, can, be, will, can follow a similar pattern. Uh, so the splitting in two parts would be the, um, instead of doing a schema alter to do perform the rename you would per, you would have two migrations one migration would be uh i'm going to create the new table name so not a rename but a, cre a table name creation and the second part of the migration would be i'm going to delete the old table name not the old table column name these are columns and so by taking something that was a, re a single rename SQL event and splitting it into two parts, an add and then a remove, what you can do is you can deliver the additive changes as part of the migrations with the Y release, and you can deliver the deleting co delete column migration, the second half of the migration, in the Y plus one release. 
because by the time Y plus one is here, and its application code is already using the new table name and all your servers are using the new table, the new co table column name. Uh, you can apply that migration freely because the old column is in total non-use. And so this is the splitting approach pattern. So Brian, I'm gonna, I, I think I've got that. I wanna walk through it and you guys can tell me when I go wrong. So my cluster, let's say, is at 3.y minus one right now. And there's, you know, table A has column A1 that I want eventually to have be named column A2, right? Does that make sense so far? So all of my y minus one code is talking about column A1. We're gonna upgrade the cluster to 3.y. And, and then we're gonna run the migration um, other order, other order. Uh, you run the migrations before you perform the code, the rolling restart. Yes, before we before we perform the rolling restart. Um, but on the I'm following the list that's right here under what does zero downtime upgrade process look like? All my nodes are going to upgrade the code, not restart. Uh, it's just the code. Okay, yeah. For now, upgrade it, and they're Thank all you. they're all resting on disk at. 3.y, but they're not actually running yet. And so the code on disk knows about A2, but the running code knows A1. We run the migration, so now we have A1 and A2. And the, the old code still works because the data is still there. And now we start restarting the services on the cluster. And as a node comes up, it starts using A2, but for some period of time, and that might be measured, by the way, in weeks, because we've seen, we know that this is how users do things, is they upgrade and they wait for a thing to get stable on the Y release while still leaving Y minus one back there. Um, the old code is still looking at the A1 column. The new code that is now existing is looking at A2. Um, eventually, all of my cluster is at 3.y, and it's all looking at the A.2 column, and so at Y plus one, I upgrade my code and it can do whatever the hell it wants, but there's a migration in there that deletes A1 because no code can be running and looking at the database that knows about the A1 column at the point that the, that the, the Y plus one release goes out. And I feel like I could have said that more succinctly, but is that, that's, the, that's the approach that, that's how this works, right? That's the idea. OK. OK. Yes, but as you pointed it out, I think there's a reasonable amount of time where you need to sync A1 and A2. And neither the old nor the new code can do that. So there must be some third party. Maybe it's a database feature that you say, this column is always a function of that column. Oh, I yeah, see I agree. I see what you mean. Um, yeah, there's ways, there's a variety of ways you could do that down at the database level. Uh, like my off the top of the headway is when I introduce A2, at the same time, I'm going to introduce a trigger on A1 that whenever you update or insert or delete from A1, it does the equivalent operation on A2, for example. I don't know if that's the best way. There are definitely other ways to do that, but that's a good point that we'd have to, that's part of the how to do this. Uh, how to do this little waltz would have to be considered. Agreed completely. Yeah, I'm trying to capture this um, in the bullet points uh, under the plug and writer documentation. Yeah, we can I, capture as much as you can, Dennis, but I'm sure we'll, we'll need to, you know, massage the, the information and I'm perfect. I will volunteer for trying to write this up if necessary, if, you know, as we get to that point. Uh, yeah. So what other considerations need to be um, made? So the, the, the migration, the class of migration that concerns me, and I know there's got to be an answer out there because other people have done this, um, is the kind of migration that we did, for example, when we were trying to get the uh, import export stuff for pulp RPM, and we had to change the ordinality of some data entities. They had a lot of duplicates and they couldn't allow duplicates. 
because that was both a that was a schema change, a very complicated data migration change, and it also changed the code where the code had been willing to deal with, I might get multiple answers back, and it had to change to, I'm only going to get one answer back. And I don't know exactly how we're going to do those kinds of changes, um, but I'm sure that there's there's been research out there on them because that's not an atypical kind of problem. I, I think um, this is a bit of a hand wavy answer. Um, that's a that's a legitimate problem though, for sure. And I <clears throat> believe in those situations, uh, you may need to um, you may need to not ship your migration right away. In fact, you might need to ship um, application code that gets rolled out prior to any database changes occurring, which would kind of split it over over three um, releases. Perhaps that happens in a uh, a ZStream release um, where the ZStream provides the final ZStream prior to the new Y.0, which ships the migration, the Y.0 would allow you to deliver new application code. And perhaps you need to have that new application code prior to anything changing in the DB. So basically, you spread it out over more time. And I think that the, the there's an there's an onus on either the pull core or the plugin writer, whoever wherever the chain that class of change has to be made, that to make to maintain zero downtime for a while, your code needs to know that. Sometimes, if you ask the question, sometimes you're going to get one answer. Sometimes you're going to get two. The, the it's it puts a, a bigger onus on the code writer, which I'm okay with because this is not a this isn't a common thing. It's going to happen, but this is not the 90% case. It's probably not even the 20% case. Um, but it is the it is something we need to think about how to how to give instruction to people on how to address it in a way that lets the system continue executing while we're walking through all these complicated steps. Anyway, the, yep. the if, all if, that, you look, if you look into folks like, um, there's some interesting talks from the um, the build and deployment folks at, for instance, like Facebook, for example. And um, it's, it's basically the stuff you're talking about. Um, it's, uh, they have to, at Facebook, because they're changing the things so often, <laughs> that um, their application code oftentimes in some places um, needs to expect the data layer to be two different ways. And then over time, they end up removing that after the migrations have all been applied in Quiesce. Exactly right. Exactly. Like I, I don't have any of these resources to hand, but I have skimmed a bunch of things over the years, partially to get my own head out of the idea that, no, you just have to shut, you have to turn things off and on again to make everything work. Um, as we come up with things like this, do we have a spot where we can drop the papers that we're finding uh, that'll that talk about how to do this complicated stuff? We actually have a ticket that's already opened. Um, cool. Yeah, it's seventy one twenty. Yes, thank you, Brian. And can we? I'll put it down here in the uh, resources. Yeah. Right. yeah, that'd be great. If you can't tell, my big push here is is not to naysay this even a little bit, but simply to make sure that we don't reinvent wheels because some of these wheels are really difficult and some really bright people have done brilliant work on it. I'd rather take advantage of them than learn everybody else's mistakes on our own. That's my favorite part of open source. <laughs> Is that you get to stand on shoulders of giants. Exactly. <clears throat> I have another question. Yeah. Um, is there a plan and action how we identify changes that are critical with respect to migrations? Um, my understanding is that we just ask Django, like, are there migrations? Or I, I, did I not understand the question correctly? I, I my, my take on it, not that it's to me, is um, that we need to have the CI uh, regex inspect um, the migrations that are produced at pre-merge time. And there are specific statements that we can look for. There's a very limited number of statements that will cause application failures. And one of the resources down at line 39 outlines that person's analysis of um, regexes 
which we could use in our CI to um, identify, oh, look, on this PR, this is a downtime migration. We cannot merge this PR. And then what happens is when people split, when people split it into the two parts, like we were talking about earlier, these reg reg regexes won't find those destructive statements because they won't be there anymore. Can we start running those like right now, not as fatal errors, but just as like infos out of CI? Just even with no other work done, just as part of CI, as part of Travis say, hey, I'm looking at your migrations. Come the revolution, these, this kind of thing is going to be a problem just so we can get used to looking for that, for those kind of uh, things. I mean, we, we definitely can, and I'm not on the CI team, but one of the challenges is that if the CI passes green, people tend not to look at the log. That's, right. That's fair. That's fair. But I think no way uh, to this... turn it yellow for this reason. We could. I mean, I'm just interested in, in no, gathering I mean, data as we move forward. That's the problem. Yeah, but if there's some way, like perhaps uh, we have it post a comment back on the PR. Perhaps this is a GitHub action that just runs regexes outside of Travis. I mean, like, um, I should not be naysaying it because um, that's not how I feel about it. I think that that would be a great idea. Yeah, and we cannot move forward without CI for this. Um, and so uh, CI definitely goes hand in hand. Sure. I was just thinking we could start doing these inspections without any actual impact on our process or hitting any of our deadlines. So we can start seeing the training ourselves to look and go, oh, oh yeah, that was kind of a dangerous thing to do. Just so we get our heads in that mindset, as it were, before we actually start taking the concrete steps for changing our development process. Well, so that leads me to another question. Um, do we want to set a goal for when we want to start supporting such upgrades? My take on it is, and I'm super into it, is um, that we should try a fake it till we make it strategy. Um, and what that is is that we wouldn't change the installer at all, uh, although we might correct that thing that we talked about earlier. Mm -hmm. um, but we wouldn't. We wouldn't actually make this claim for users. We wouldn't actually um, have the installer perform roll and restart, all the stuff that it would need to do to actually make it real so that users can benefit. But what we would try to do is uh, write our application code in our migrations as if we were and see how it goes. If it's an absolutely intolerable process, then maybe we don't do it. If it turns out that it's cheap and easy and we get through two Y releases, without any problems, then we flip the switch official. Cool. That sounds like uh, what Grant was saying it would be really good to do and add the CI checks uh, soon so that we can actually start seeing some information about this. I, so I have a question. And let me know if it's too much deep into the detail. Um, so you said that when we split migrations into two parts, the second will be delivered with the Z release. Uh, um, no, no, no. I think it's with the next, with the following Y release. Sorry, yeah, with the following, yes. So we can upgrade properly. OK, so with the next Y release, um, how do you plan to, how do you think we can track that? Like, the work is done. I'm working on this right now. I wrote migration right now. And then there is this hanging part, which we should not forget for the next release. Uh, that's a good pro That's a good question. We'll definitely need a way not to forget about it. Um, although if we do forget about it, it's not really the worst thing in the world. If we noticed it, oh, later we forgot to delete this table. It's not in use. Um, but what we could do is um, create the future milestone create the issue to perform the column removal and put it on the milestone. That way, when that release comes around and there's the blocker review meeting, we'll see that that's a piece of work or some other way to track it. And could we run this second migration um, right after all the services started working? Like 
uh, right after the upgrade is done and everything is up? It's possible. Um, it's definitely possible. Uh, what that would look like is we would, the application code would contain both halves of the migration. And what we would need to do though, is we would need to have the migrate command that the installer runs um, pass the additional parameter to specify the specific migrate to version. So you'd say application layer or Django, just migrate us to migration 54. And and there would be another phase where the installer would know, oh, actually now it's safe for us to go to, after the rolling restart, after the application servers are all online, oh, now we go to 59. Or now we go the rest of the way. It doesn't even need to know the, the second point you go all the way, basically. And we could ship them together. I mean, that's a thing. It's just they require installer coordination. And if a user does it wrong, eh, it's not the worst, not the worst thing in the world either their application servers error a little bit. <laughs> well, they did it wrong. I mean, what can I say? Uh, I've taken too many sev ones from customers that did it wrong. <laughs> so that's the safety. That's the risk. That's the reward. So the thing that's in my head for this, as we think about how what we want to do is the world that everybody is moving into is not, I'm an administrator, and even if, I, you know, my pulp, cluster isn't my six machines that I SSH into all the time. It's a giant mass of pods in OpenShift somewhere um, that are coming and going and, and that I can spin up and spin down. And whatever we, we do in our heads, we have, to, we have to look at that as it has to work in that environment, where what the, what the admin does, all, and, and this is the reality, because like I say, I have taken customer issues from this particular reality, is the admin literally doesn't know how to do much of anything other than, than say, upgrade to a bunch of new pods and then shut down the old ones and bring up the new ones, or actually more, more likely bring up the new ones. And when they're all up and running and happy, now I'm going to shut down the old ones. They're not on the command line on those machines. They're not running individual commands on the, they're not even machines. They're whatever they happen to be out in the, in the cloud world. Um, and again, I know this is a solved problem and these the stuff we're talking about here are all pieces, parts for how it is solved. But in our heads, we need to, we need to realize that we're the, the world, the computing world is not, is heading away from the individual admin who's SSH into his systems to an admin who just has a dashboard of pods all over the place. Um, one thing on the other end of that uh, path, um, we are always talking about creating migrations here, but we don't write them. We, we create them by changing the models. So maybe yeah, this but... is more of a, it, it needs to be that way. So that means splitting the migration is you change the model in a way that is additive only, and you create the migration and then you yeah. Do the other half, and then you create the next next migration. And that's yeah, because the, the other option is manually writing migrations, which we will probably have to do at some point for some crazy issue. But we definitely want to avoid it. I agree with you that okay. it's yeah. Having just done a really really complicated one recently, yes, we definitely want to avoid it. Although I will say that the Django um tooling for doing that is so much better than writing you know raw sql and and the previous ways i've done it so it's not nearly as painful as it could be mm -hmm. um the, there's a lot of support there for it but we definitely want to avoid it but yeah it's in the example we used before matthias you'd have model that knows about a one field a1 and then for a while you'd have model that knows about a1 and a2 and then the next release this model only knows about a2 um, and whether the code uses one or the other is a different story. Yeah, that's right. The code will have to, if I'm responsible for that model, there might be, depending on the kind of migration, there might be a time where my code has to say, if a one in model, then I'm going to do one thing and, and otherwise. So that's where I was talking about there, there will be migrations where as code authors, you are responsible for knowing you might be straddling multiple worlds. 
I mean, Tommy, you're not wrong. <laughs> I know. I yeah, Matthias. There is a way to add SQL to Django migrations. There it is. is. Yep. I will, however, Lucky for Grant. I'm very proud of myself. <laughs> I didn't use that with that complicated migration because holy shit, was it easier to do in Python than in SQL. <laughs> Yeah, um, Matthias, I think you're describing the mechanics of how to do that very well. Uh, I think what using, um, <clears throat> you know, not writing these migrations by hand is important because one of my goals is to not slow down or make the development process more complicated. That's actually my biggest concern with this type of a change. So what you're saying sounds great. Um, and also in the, in, I said this before too, but um, if we need to ship application code that runs prior to the migration, the first migration running, then we should do it in the previous Z stream. And th that's, I think, a very fine thing. You just need to make sure that you upgrade your to the latest Z stream uh, last release before you go to the next Y release. And perhaps there's a particular mode, and maybe it's the default for the installer that says, I really need zero downtime migrations. And it performs a check to make sure that your stuff is on the latest Z stream. Right. And that way, this process goes easy peasy. And perhaps it just carries you through that upgrade all automatically. Yeah, that's, a, that's what I good. It definitely needs to be aware of the whole cluster, though, because it needs to take the whole cluster through that. Uh, it, it will. It will. Spritzy is going to take us there. Spritzy, I hope you're watching this. <laughs> That's a uh, classic question. You give the hard parts to whoever's not in the meeting. Um, I think we are about to set in place another policy that allows kind of zero downtime plugin updates, where we already spread like uh, you can use that plugin with two versions of Pulp Core. Yep. Is that interfering with the zero downtime here? Does that mean updating might be spread over more releases even? I don't perceive them as being related. Um, we, okay. the depre, uh, the plugin call interface having a longer deprecation cycle should allow just that, which is that um, uh, you can like pulp core itself will need to uh, have tables that involve plugging code adhere to this policy as well. And so I believe that by doing it in pulp core and following the deprecation cycle, the plugins will receive its benefit without additional effort. I'm thinking, so my, Matthias, that's a really good question. I think I agree with Brian that it would, it, that they're, uh, Orthogonal, I suspect. I but I in like I, in the back of my head, I'm like I I think I can almost imagine a place where we'll need to have a three, a three Y thing, but maybe we won't. I suspect this will be something we learn um, as we as we start thinking this way, and as we start as as Brian pointed out, as we start developing this way, even if we're not claiming we support it, we will learn stuff, and I think that we'll be making tweaks to our our process as we go forward. Okay, you now you're just too cool, and I want to sing the the shiny song from Moana. I'm just saying. I'm for, yeah, yeah. <laughs> awesome. Go ahead, Tanya. I just wanted to, to. I mean, I understand the potential need for the upgrading to the latest Z stream for every upgrade. But I think it might be perceived as very undesirable for users. Yeah, I I agree. Uh, I agree with that. And while that's um, structurally an option to deliver application code ahead of the migration, I would like to, um, as we explore going down this road in this fake it till we make it strategy, not adopt that. Um, let's not make that a requirement right from the start because that's an absolute. Um, you know, that's the, uh, I ran out of options. We have to do it this way, but we shouldn't start there. 
And let's be clear, for, for where we had been over the last six months in pulp, these kinds of migrations were not infrequently, they existed. We were making changes at that level. Most of the fixes that happen in Y releases, one, don't require model changes. So they're trivial, right? You you upgrade the, the code and then you just re, you do a rolling restart and everything works. Um, and of the ones that are going to require model changes going forwards, they're going to they are going to be additive. They're going to be we're adding new features, we're adding new plugins, and they are also not a problem. You just upgrade the code, you do the migration, you restart how, whenever you want to, and the ones that have restarted have new new stuff, and the ones that haven't restarted don't. Um, so it's not like this is a, a, a 75% of the time when we're fixing problems, we have to be very careful about this. Um, it's, but we, we do need to start thinking in this way, but this isn't the main path of the kinds of things that happen in applications that are where we are in Pulp3's life cycle right now. At least that's my, my impression. Yep, I agree. So we're at our time. Yeah, um, and I want to talk about next steps, but I need to. I was waiting to see if this came up, but it didn't. So um, there's this issue that people talk about with zero downtime migrations, um, where there's a table lock. Um, so the way that these uh, the issue is that a table lock during the migration uh, causes the migration application, uh, the applying of it, to um, practically take minutes to hours. Um, this is on extremely large databases. I don't think this is necessarily a problem that we're going to experience. But one of the resources in this link is this project called um, Django PG0 Downtime Migrations. I don't think we should rush out and use this project, but its purpose in the world is to address this problem. And the problem is that uh, you want to be um, smarter about applying the migrations to avoid database transactional situations that are unbearably long, which would cause your application code to have an error, even though the change you're making isn't really even affecting your application code. And so what it does is it batches your SQL calls and turns your table locks into row locks, which affect a smaller portion, which reduce the amount of time those locks are applied, which allows the database to chunk through your long ass table in pieces. So just to call it out, that's a thing. There's an answer. There you go. Yeah, but there's an answer. So, I mean, if I if you think about, for example, like the container plugin, where it has repos with hundreds of thousands of files in them, right? We're going to hit big, big, big tables, and that may become useful. I think Brian faster than we think it's gonna. No, we're just gonna get the data model right from the beginning, and it'll be that's fine. right. That's right. We're never, no changes to data model. Perfect. If you don't like it, it's your fault. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, thank you for sharing that, Brian. Um, and thank you all of you for the great uh, discussion. This was awesome. I'm going to stop recording now. Hey, Dennis, um, is there a next steps part of this, this chat? Uh, yeah, we have that ticket. Um, and I think we should update it. That I think it contains most of this information already, um, but I think uh, we should um, repurpose that ticket to make it into the fake it till we make it um, approach where we will add CI to kind of give us um, more information about what our migrations are doing uh, and go with it from that i really do think that we need the first thing we have to do is add ci that looks for these things. yeah yeah uh do we want to uh, not promote but kind of share our intentions on the mailing list because at sure. some point when we decide to switch to it i guess we would need to have some kind of if this plugin supports zero downtime migration or if this does not so plugin writers will be aware of it, but it's kind of coming, or at least uh, there are plans. Yeah, I think we want to we want to publicize this partially for that, Tanya, but partially because we there's a lot of bright people as as you know we've we've had input from this week, 
who might look at look at a first, hey, we're working, we're working towards zero downtime and go, oh shit, I did that full time for six months and I'm can I help kind of thing. So I'd really like to publicize this early that we're working towards it, not any promises for schedule, but just we recognize that this is a need and we've got ideas kind of thing. So we can get yeah, yeah. Uh, pulp dev, like not pulp list, but pulp dev for plugin writers mostly. Yeah, I cool. agree completely with that. That sounds great. Huge plus one. I'm seeing action items at four to line forty four and forty five. Yep. Uh it's now an email to pulp dev. Is that what we were thinking we want to do it? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, I think that's a good point. Yep. Yeah, because users will just be like, Yay. Um, well, no, user, users will be like, oh, so I can have it Tuesday, and we don't want that. <laughs> yeah. And who will be able to send this email? I can definitely send Dennis, this Dennis, obviously. <laughs> yep. <clears throat> and... I will also work on getting a ticket um, onto our sprint, not necessarily the next sprint or anything, but uh, that will focus on the CI. Does that sound good? Awesome. All right. Now I'm going to stop the recording. <laughs> now that it's all on record. <laughs> Um, let's see how I do that. <laughs>